Hey everyone, thank you for joining us here this evening for our live stream event, Exploring the Benefits of Virtual Working and Learning. My name is Bo Jansen, I'm an education lead here at Noman, and as with great honor, I'll be introducing and hosting our panel of guests here tonight. But before I introduce them, I wanna say a couple things. First off, I wanna thank Lenovo for sponsoring this event. Lenovo helps us to continue to bring these free educational events to you, so thanks as always to Lenovo. And uh, this live stream is going to be added to Noman's stream catalog. It's going to be available to watch on our Twitch and YouTube channels after the event uh, concludes this evening. And uh, all of our events, uh, including this live stream, are available with closed captions uh, via the Noman Facebook page. And you can find a link to the Facebook page uh, in the chat. Um, and with that said, uh, let me go and introduce our guests for the evening. We have Marco Amador, an asset supervisor. Uh, Marco has lent his talents as a modeler, texture, uh, designer, animator, and pipeline developer to a multitude of projects at major Los Angeles area studios, including feature films, game cinematics, music videos, advertisements, and interactive apps. A graduate of Noman's prestigious certificate program, he has also brought his skills to the classroom as an instructor. His credits include X-Men Apocalypse, Zoolander 2, NBA 2K16, Pan, and X-Men Days of Future Past. We also have Jana Ruth, an advanced effect, uh, VFX artist, uh, she is a Los Angeles native. Jenna, uh, Jenna Ruth is a VFX artist at Insomniac Games and has worked in the games industry for five years. After graduating from Noman in 2016, she started her career as an environment artist for VR games, but quickly fell in love with real-time VFX. Before that, she studied oil painting at Sarah Lawrence College. At Insomniac Games, she has worked on Marvel's Spider-Man, The City That Ever Sleeps DLCs, Spider-Man Miles Morales, and Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart. Jen is passionate about representation and visual storytelling. We also have Brandon Zhao, lead VFX artist. Brandon Zhao is a real-time VFX artist working in Los Angeles as a lead FX artist at Halon Entertainment. After graduating from Noman School of Visual Effects, he continues to explore the boundaries of real-time effects and has worked for clients such as Epic Games, Marvel, NBA, and more. And lastly, we have Michelle Sharp, effects apprentice. Michelle Sharp is a visual effects artist and freelance photographer based in Los Angeles, California. She obtained a BA in art and an M uh, BS in applied to mathematics at USC Santa Barbara in 2018, and then graduated from Noman's digital production program in December 2020. She is currently working as an effects apprentice at Walt Disney Animation Studios. So welcome to all of you. Thank you all for joining us here this evening. Yay, there you all are. So. We've got four Noman alumni here, uh, two of which uh, went from in-person work to virtual work, and two that went from in-person learning at the school when we were all running to virtual learning when we switched over and now transition into virtual work. So um, I, I think this experience you've all had is going to give us some insight into kind of um, how this is all working, working and learning here um, in an online paradigm. Um, we heard your bios, but I, I want to hear a bit more of, about you. So maybe Marco and Jenna, um, if you can kind of give us an overview of the kind of work you do and the roles you play in your studios. Sure. Uh, I guess I'll start. <clears throat> sure. So uh, let's see. I graduated Noman back in 2011 and started doing generalist work. As the background gave me kind of a good good headway into doing a bit of everything. Um, I did some games work at Disney and then eventually, you know, freelanced for about seven years and landed at Framestore where I've been since 2017. Uh, okay. Mostly as a modeler, texture artist, uh, and then eventually modeling supervisor and working assets across the board. Uh, yeah, I've done film, games, commercials, TV shows, Apps, uh, literally, I mean, anything that needs assets, I've made assets for, uh, and it's it's been a long, long time, so it's been good. Cool, very good, thank you. Super cool. Yeah, um, so I'm a visual effects artist at Insomniac Games. My role there is pretty interdisciplinary. Um, similar to film effects, I make things like explosions or water waves or hit impacts. Um, the main difference is, in addition to thinking about narrative components, I also, we do a lot of like user experience type stuff, so the player being able to understand what's happening in the game or what their health is. Um, and doing that role, I end up working with a lot of teams like design, animation, character, lighting, and that's about it. Cool. Very nice. Thank you. And um, Brandon and Michelle also um, 
I'd like to know what your uh, roles are in your studios, but also if you could kind of tell us uh, transitioning from student to professional, uh, what was kind of your focus at Noman? Uh, like what, what was on your reels? I mean, I know, but we can <laughs> share with the audience. Um, and, you know, so kind of uh, what your focus was as a student and now what you do as a professional. Um, yeah, so I graduated from Noman like just this past December. Uh, so when I started, I kind of started out just trying a little bit of everything and then I decided to focus in visual effects. Uh, but I speci specifically wanted to focus um, on effects for animated features. Uh, so that's kind of how I uh, geared my reel towards that. Uh, and I uh, graduated, like I said, in December and then I immediately got a job at Disney Animation as a first a trainee and then now an apprentice uh, working on their features. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, I graduated Noman last year around July, and I got a job at Halon Entertainment right, uh, right after I graduated. I started off as a visual effects artist, and I became a effects lead uh, earlier this year. I mostly worked from previs to um, game cinematics and uh, game trailers. Uh, we kind of wear a lot of hats and do a lot of things from pipelines to making explosions and um, creating um, like traffic systems from films. So we we do a lot of things and it's a lot of fun. Cool, very good. Um, now, this time last year, I know everybody was kind of switching over from one way of working to another and um, presumably, uh, every place you're working had projects are already running. So in the midstream, while you're already got your, the machine of your studio working with people, uh, here in person, now you're switching to, uh, you know, having to be all everybody's at home working remotely. So, um, anything you want to say about sort of, um, you know, initially switching gears to work remotely, um, what that was kind of like for you and, and the projects you're working on at the time. Anybody want to pick up on that? Sure, I'll I'll hop in. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I for me, I I've been in the commercial world for the last four or five years now, uh, strictly. Done some ride work, done a lot of device stuff, um, print ads, billboards, everything. Uh, when we were first kind of hit with the pandemic, I think it was maybe. The first week of March was when I had transitioned to work from home. Uh, I was working on a very NDA show that I can never talk about, but it was it was a good sign to see that they were willing to allow that because mm -hmm. the, the reality of the situation was working for a secret job was, you know, if you don't allow this to happen, we're not going to have it. We're not going to be able to deliver on that. Yeah. Um, and they were very quick to give their blessing. Um, they you know, did a basic questionnaire of kind of what was your workstation at home like? You're not doing this on your kitchen table, right? You know, they said, no, I've got an office. I've got blackout windows. I've got locked doors and I have a wall safe if I need to use it to stash something overnight. You, know, I was like, you can trust me with whatever you send me. Um, and that kind of, for the job I was on, eased a lot of tensions. There, you know, I wasn't the only one. Everybody kind of went down that, that path of a uh, you know, brief survey. Um, and really, once we, you know, technical issues aside, everybody brought home a Teradici and a, a workstation monitor if you need an ISO for color calibration, all the lighters did. Uh, you know, for the first maybe month of March, there was a few hurdles, technical issues, uh, bandwidth problems with internet connections and everything, because the whole world started working from home a couple weeks after that. Uh, but once we made that move, it, it's been pretty seamless ever since. Uh, I'm very happy doing it. It's been a good transition. And I think that uh, now that we've got our kind of feet settled in it and it's been a year, we've, we've shown that it, it works and we're all pretty happy doing it. Cool. Mine was kind of similar to that, totally. Like, um, it's funny thinking back a year for, uh, ago, it's, in a way it was almost kind of surreal. Like around February, we were talking about like, 
okay, some people might go home, we're going to see, we're going to play it out. And then all of a sudden, one week, it was like everybody out of the office this week. Um, and I got to say, I mean, the IT team did like an amazing job because they had to all of a sudden get everybody with their workstations to their home and then get VPN up and running for pretty much the whole studio. Um, and like right after that, we actually worked on the teaser trailer together. So I guess that was pretty, pretty strange, like having to like do a little mini crunch on something and having the camaraderie with people. But instead of seeing other people at the office late at night, like we're all just on Slack and um, pinging each other all the time. But I don't know, it was kind of cool in a way to go through that together. And I, yeah, I, I think this, the beginning of the lockdown was when all the IT people began freaking out because I know Noman had the same thing <laughs> that we had a lot of packaging up. I mean, we were basically I'm just wrapping up our, uh, our our labs and all the workstations. So yes, I think that was a, a big scramble. Uh, so just to kind of getting the technical boring stuff out of the way, in terms of uh, the physical setup, so um, uh, you've got a, uh, a, a Teradici, you said. Um, uh, so uh, Marco, you yeah. got a Teradici at home. And um, Jenna, you're working with a, a loaner machine and a VPN. Yep. Okay. And uh, some dev kits. Okay. Uh, just out of curiosity, uh, Michelle and Brandon, how are you handling the, the physical equipment? Um, I have a little VPN box. I'm like working in uh, or remoting into a machine in okay. the office. Okay, cool. I basically use my home machine and then just remote into a machine at work, which is 25 minutes away. <laughs> I've been <laughs> to the office once. And I just like kind of see where my office is, it's just like seeing a corner, but that, that's where my computer is. <laughs> wow, uh, very surreal. Oh, it's yeah. crazy. Um, well, so the uh, two of you, uh, Michelle and Brandon, um, going through uh, finishing up your education and then getting a real trying to network, trying to uh, interview and get a job, going through that whole process when you're not in the same room with the people, you know, in the same building. Uh, you want to talk to that? How, how was that to try to get employed uh, as just a, a remote face on a screen? Um, for me, it was, I actually got kind of lucky because I only ended up uh, applying and interviewing for one job. But I, mm -hmm. for me, I like transitioning, like going and finishing. Well, I actually started my reel right when we uh, transitioned to work from home. So mm -hmm. I kind of worked on all my pieces at home, which on one hand was kind of nice, but it was also the more difficult part was just getting, uh, reaching out to help, to ask for help from other students and from, from professors. Uh, but then in the fall, I really wanted to apply for the, the job for Disney and the application was due in October and I wasn't set to graduate till December. Um, so I kind of really reached out to everyone that was uh, available to help me uh, kind of like finish my reel a little bit faster than I was expecting to. Uh, and then I was able to kind of go through the whole interview process, uh, just, you know, the way we're doing now over Zoom, uh, mm -hmm. which wasn't quite as scary as I expected it to be, actually. Uh, and then, you know, it all worked out for that. I, you know, got really lucky. But. No, that's, that's great. I mean, I, that's awesome. Uh, the advice of only apply to Disney and that's it is not to be taken. <laughs> like, dang, no, no. girl. <laughs> no, but you, you had a very focused reel. Your reel was mm -hmm. for that kind of work. It was a very yeah. uh, uh, unique reel in terms of effects reels. So, you know, I'll say you're, you're lucky. You, you definitely, um, your reel was focused towards that effort. Um, so yeah, yeah, you can say I, I agreed for Disney and that was it. And I got the job. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Brandon, how about you? Uh, well, my reel is geared towards uh, real time effects. So I started my reel like right around the time we got on remote as well. So I kind of lucked out where I was able to render a lot of my stuff through Unreal Engine and got a lot of help from my professors to um, get my reel up and running. And Nomen has a really, really great network. So I actually got a referral from a bunch of Nomen students who worked in my current studio. And, um, sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> uh, and being able to, like, you know, already know some of the people at my studio, it was a pretty easy transition going from normal into being able to work remotely at Halon. 
Awesome. And um, in terms of uh, uh, Marco and Jenna, do you know about uh, recruitment interview and, and the interview process and hiring from your perspective, you know, of bringing on new members of the team, again, when these need to be people that are uh, trusted team members and you aren't there with them? Uh, any, what's your perspective on that? Um, yeah, it was... So going from interviewing somebody in person, looking at their reel, going over, you know, scrubbing through frames with them side by side and kind of talking over certain shots, you you lose a lot of that. And you kind of treat it like a daily session where you're just sitting in and going over a timeline and it's, it's eerily similar of you're gonna call and trying to scrub through something and talk about a certain frame. It's just, it's a little awkward, it's a little weird, but it, you know, eventually it works out. Um, I think for the most part, out of all the people we've onboarded in the last year, it's, uh, it's all been freelance because, you know, there was the initial panic of pandemic, everybody freaked out, certain jobs got canceled. So, you know, instead of ramping up for a big show, doing cinematic piece, it was dead in the water, you know, triage mode. Uh, so we've actually had a bit of a hiring freeze and... The, the interviews I have done were with freelancers. And for the most part, it's people that are either recommendations or people that I've known that I've worked with because I freelance forever. And so it's people that I've, I've known for you know the last 10 years. Um, but I think that the, the process of onboarding somebody is it's the same manner. It's just, a, it's kind of like this. You, you, when you do an interview with somebody, you can hop on a call and you talk about this, that, whatever. And, get a feel for the situation, get a, get a sense of their personality, what their fit's going to be, uh, and, you know, how you could see yourself working with them. Totally. Like, I feel like it's almost kind of strange how not different it is in some ways. <laughs> like, you know, everybody, you're just, it's just people talking to people. So you're, you're kind of getting a vibe of like, okay, do you seem, you know, like, you know what you're talking about? Do you, are you excited about this? Um, are you like mature? Um, and uh, yeah, so Zoom interviews don't really feel super different in a way. I guess the biggest difference is before when we did them in person, we got to go to lunch with the person, which also helped to be able to just hang out with them in a more relaxed context. But um, I don't know, I feel like we get most of it done through the video call part. Yeah. Uh, cool. Um, now all of you, uh, you're LA based, but uh, you're working with other people in other branch studios at other places. So uh, you can kind of let us know what, when you're interacting with other team members, uh, where physically are they? Um, um, for me, a lot of, yeah, a lot of my conversations are the same as they have always been. Um, we've got a site in India, Montreal, Chicago, New York, there's us, and London. And I think that's it. And then Framestore over the summer acquired Method and Encore. And I have a bunch of friends at Method. Uh, and so I've been in contact with Method Montreal about a certain show, working back and forth with them and just balancing everything time zone wise. It's kind of always been the same. It's, I'm a night owl, I'm horrible in the mornings. And so, London is easy enough for me to get in contact with because I'm up at 3 a.m. anyways because I just I can't sleep. Um, and so it's the beginning of their day. I can ping them, do a little back and forth if I need to, go to sleep. When I wake up, it's the end of their day, and I can double check, you know, hey, about that thing we were talking about. Before you go home, let me know. Um, and that's that's been kind of my, my song and dance with uh, the time zones is that – I've, I keep weird hours anyways. It didn't matter if I was in the office or not. I was I was always talking to everybody. <laughs> I never shut up, so apologies. <laughs> it, it's, it's a hazard. Uh, an occupational for, hazard. <laughs> um, for us, I guess, you know, we have a, a one other office in North Carolina, and then I know some teams do some outsourcing. Um, and it was sort of fortuitous in a way with them because they'd been working on a lot of VR projects, and they were just coming off of that and really integrating into some of the projects that the um, LA office was working on. And so in a way, all of us being online and commuting or uh, communicating remotely 
made it easier because we weren't in a meeting where, you know, they're the only people on Zoom and everyone else is in the room together. Um, I guess the only thing is the time difference, but that really just only manifests in a way where like, okay, I can't ping this person at 6 p.m., but just being a little bit mindful of that, it's not super different for me. Yeah. Uh, Michelle, Brandon, about you guys? We're almost all, I think everyone that I'm working with is either in California or there's like a couple people that are scattered, but it hasn't really affected us in any like noticeable way. I think the majority of us are still living here, so yeah. okay. not too different. During the quarantine, like a lot of people in my studio kind of moved all over the country. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, nice to see like people's like homes in like Colorado, <laughs> in Texas, like uh, we also work with a lot of people in like North Carolina and London as well. Um, so we kind of, you know, just talk to each other during like your normal work hours. And, you know, like I do get people paying me at like 7 a.m. and just like, oh, okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll answer this at night. <laughs> Uh, just a thought too about like seeing people's homes. It's really, I don't know, it's kind of fun in a voyeuristic sort of way to get to see people's like pets and um, mm -hmm. I don't know, sometimes kids just like run through the background, like, you know, just see a little bit of slice of their life. Yes. You're just seeing a sad little white walls for me. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say it's the opposite for me because the rest of my house is just, it's all white and uh, wood and 5,000 plants and it's gorgeous. My wife has done so much work in our house. And then my office is this sad, dark gray room with blackout windows. So it is, it's a little awkward in, in that people are like, you live like that? I've been to your house. Yeah, that's not what you, your house looks like. <laughs> my office is, I, I like my dark area, my music loud. I mean, my coworkers have been slowly watching this plant get taller and taller. It started out like this tall, and now it's gone. Like, I want it to go all the way to the ceiling. But. You should I put it on the floor one day and just make them get, take a shrink? Yeah. I'm just like, put it on a different off. surface every day. So, exactly. <laughs> I'm guessing. See if they notice. I think they're going insane. <laughs> um, how about this? What are the. Uh, what tools are you all using for your virtual communication for email, chat, video conferencing? Just kind of what, uh, what mechanisms are you employing? Um, as for, we've, we've done like town hall meetings with Zoom, but for the most part, it's, it's uh, Google Suite. So Gchat, Gmail, um, using that for meetings. Um, I think uh, working between different companies, we've been using Slack. So when I'm working with uh, Method Montreal, it's been conversations over Slack. Um, pretty much whatever, you know, the, the, the most things everybody uses, it's just kind of different companies require different things. And so you switch over for that, for those conversations. Um, yeah, I think anybody else, any other? Zoom and Slack. Yeah, no. yeah pretty much. Okay, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, uh, talking about onboarding um, new artists, I know that um, I mean, everybody thrives in a environment of being around other creative people and just kind of the um, learning by proximity that goes on. But I know that can be especially a challenge for junior artists who are still uh, taking on so much new information so quickly. So um, uh, how does uh, the studio, um, how do your respective studios handle uh, this kind of nurturing of junior artists to make sure that they still are able to aggressively learn and continue to gain their skills? Um, as far as the asset disciplines go, I've done a lot of demos, just screen sharing and going over uh, workflows. Um, next week, I'm, I'm still scheduling it with crewing. That's why I keep looking over at my other monitor. Uh, I'm trying to schedule a week for me and the juniors to do some hard surface work in the studio so I can go over some ZBrush hard surface tips and uh, Maya hard surface, um, making sure that I can ramp their skill set up. But at least every couple months, I like to go into the office with them for a couple of days, um, mm -hmm. get everything cleared with, you know, we've got a whole protocol that I've got to go through um, in order to mm -hmm. do it, but I try and schedule it 
maybe every what we did it maybe three or four times in the last six months i think and even then it was just like a day or two here and there wherever wherever there's availability in between projects and it makes sense for you know them needing to learn something we'll go in and ramp up real quick and do like actual on. formalized training sessions like yeah <laughs> yes um i tried i've tried really hard during quarantine to keep them uh kind of polished on on the asset side as far as uh modeling and texture work goes mm -hmm. um every once in a while it's 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 a lot a lot of demos online just follow me or you know you can they can log into my computer while i'm using it and i'll let them drive for a minute so they can kind of get a sense of where certain things are stuff like that um but yeah, every once in a while, it's just important to do a hands-on demo, you know, sit by side, side by side. I'm going to let you see what I do as I do it. Here's the settings I'm using. Check this out. And then letting them do it on their own with me in the room being able to offer assistance. Um, it's a little different when you're working remotely and it's, okay, I showed you how I did it. Talk to you tomorrow. Good luck. <laughs> and then, you know, you, you see where they, they can get a little... Uh, horse blinder and kind of like, I tried it and then I was working on it for hours and it was like, no, I didn't want you to do it. Like, if you get stuck for more than five minutes, ping me, I'm I'm here. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that's, that's been over the last year, the, the major concern for me is just making sure that whatever lessons are taught stick and following up and keeping that line of communication open. It's, it's super important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the communication thing, like can't, stress that enough, um, you know, ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. You're not bugging anybody. People expect you to want to like need to learn things. And so I guess just being a remote just puts a little bit more of the onus on you sometimes. Um, for us, I think there's like, we kind of diversified it, maybe being aware of the way that people learn in different ways. Like, so we've definitely realized times where, okay, we're missing some tools documentation, like, we got to write more of that. Um, one thing I think is really cool is that uh, we have this system where we assign each new person, regardless of level or juniorness, um, a buddy within their team and outside of their team. So they can just go to that person for anything to ask questions or to figure stuff out. Um, and we also have team Slack channels. So, I mean, I'm, I'm posting on there all the time, just like, what is this thing, you know? And so everybody's pretty communicative with each other. I think the, the biggest point that I've made to my juniors was even at this was back when we were in the studio was your, you were in a room with 20 other artists at a time, depending on which room you were in, it could be even more. Um, if you have a question and you don't ask it, you're shooting yourself in the foot. You've got, if you're Googling something instead of asking somebody like, Hey, how did you do a thing? Like, how do I do this or that? or whatever, you are putting yourself behind because you're not using the knowledge pool of the people around you. And I know that working remotely, that has been kind of lost for a lot of people. And I use, I've, I've barked at juniors where I was like, you need to speak the F up, like ask questions. If you, if I catch you Googling something again, that's that basic, you get mad. And, it, and, and the, the point that I made to him in that case was if you don't know the answer in, in five minutes of you Googling, you ask somebody next to you. If they don't know, you're doing them a favor because they need to know that answer. Mm -hmm. Because if they're a senior and they don't know the question or they don't know the answer to that question, then they should know it too. And you're just doing everybody a favor by keeping, you know, at, be, be ready to ask stupid questions. Never hold back. It, there's no such thing. Well, you know, every once in a while there is a dumb question. Everybody makes fun of ha ha. It, we all do it. It's it's part of the ribbing that goes on with you know, camaraderie. But it's important, and you know, you just gotta set your ego aside. Nobody has all the answers. There's been plenty of times that I've had somebody ask me a question, and I'm like, oh shit, I never thought about that. Okay, yeah, no, that's a good question. Let me find out. I'll I'll get you an answer because I should know that. Oops. Um. So yeah. It's, by all means, ping people all the time. Always, always, always ask questions. Yeah, I, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind is that no one's going to have all the answers. That I, I've been working with Maya since its inception, literally. 
and I'll have students ask me, hey, here's a basic question. I realize Wait, I've, I've just never done that in the however many years and years and years that there's always more to learn and having that kind of um, understanding that it's not bad. You don't haven't memorized all the functionality every piece of software. <laughs> you have to ask questions. Um, so, uh, Brandon and Michelle, any uh, thoughts on you on um, how uh, how are you uh, sort of nurtured in your environment to make sure that you are still aggressively learning as you go? Um, well, for me, because I'm in like an apprentice program, so it's kind of designed for you to be able to learn very easily. In the first few months, I was like paired up with a mentor, um, so I was able to ask you know questions to him whenever I wanted. But he also made it very clear, and then moving into production, that anyone in the department is available for questions. And he really encouraged me to go to literally anyone if there's something that I saw that they were working on, just in general that I really liked or that I had questions about, even if it wasn't related to something I was doing. Uh, he encouraged me to go and ask them and talk to them about it and get to know people in the department, especially because I'd never met any of them in person because I started working remotely. Um, so that's definitely something that I was also kind of struggling with is like reaching out to people myself. And I've people have really encouraged me to get better at that. And I have been getting better at going through and asking people questions and it's the same thing if I kind of can't really figure something out within five ten minutes then I go and I ask someone uh, and they almost immediately are super happy to help and every single person has been incredibly helpful and kind and like willing to put in the time to teach me uh, so that's kind of been yeah the best way for me to learn so far and that's kind of not uh, can I presume that's sort of uh, what they always had there it's just now yeah you you have you can't uh walk down the hall and ask the person the question you have to now mm -hmm. hit them up on slack yeah i like or pin them on slack yeah and sometimes if like it's a more involved question we'll like if there's time we'll set up a little one-on-one -on -one zoom call and we'll kind of go through the problem together or if it's something really quick on slack we'll just kind of go through it uh everything feels like slightly more formal than i think it normally would have been um if you have to kind of mess with someone but it's become a lot more easier uh, now over the last couple of months, like getting used to just kind of asking people, even if I've never talked to them before one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but yeah, I think it's always been like that even before they switched online. You feel that it's almost more formal, even though yeah. you're there with your plan Weirdly. behind you in your own yeah. room. <laughs> or I guess like just the process of having to, to message someone almost like, it's not even, I don't know. And especially setting up Zoom calls for things that are very like casual, just to talk to someone feels mm -hmm. slightly more formal than it would be if I just walked down the hall to ask someone a question. Mm -hmm. uh, but not so much that I, it would prevent me from doing it. Yeah. It's just a different way of thinking about it. Oh, nice. Uh, and uh, Brandon. How about you, sir? I mean, being in my studio, like everybody is really close to each other and joke around each other, so it feels like a very, you know, enjoyable, close environment where you feel open enough to ask anybody any questions. Mm -hmm. So when I first started, I was a trainee where they gave us the time to train and learn these new programs, learn the workflow, and know how to work with everyone. And throughout the process, like, you know, like everyone says, like, don't be afraid to ping someone if you have to, like, figure something out, because you can figure it out together. And you may come up with ideas that, you know, a better way to do something. And that open discussion is always really, really good for a project. Cool. Um, yeah, I, one topic I think a lot of you kind of touched on is um, building the sort of uh, open feeling that you're a team. You're all kind of in the same team. It's maybe sound kind of a hokey buzzword, but you know, team building and making kind of the promoting the culture of the studio. I know that. I mean, even at, at Noman, we have you know every Friday we have bagels ordered in, and we can all kind of go and eat bagels. That's a great time to kind of see people you might not cross in your normal daily paths and you get to just kind of chat with people at studios you'll have you know like hey at five o'clock on fridays everybody can have a beer and talk um no one doesn't have beer we're an educational institution we don't have beer so that's a, if the accreditors are watching we don't drink beer at Noman. um but uh all those kinds of things um 
that, that's time well spent, it's energy well spent to just kind of bring people together to do other kinds of things. So uh, are there any elements in place where you work for this kind of team building, you know, this kind of non-work association? We have done virtual happy hour for a stretch. That was that was interesting. That was a good glimpse of what people's houses look like because there was a lot of people on their phone with you know a beer or a cocktail in hand. Um, but yeah, it's it that the team building has been uh, it's different. It's still there. It's it's more. Um, I think a lot of it has been, especially in the commercial world, is trench mentality. It's. These are the people that you talk to every day. You guys have, you know, gone through some stuff together and working on these projects, and you—that's where the camaraderie it really kicks in. Um, and yeah, you know, that was that was always kind of my thing when I was a freelancer. Was a lot of the people that I freelanced with. It was a lot of the same pool because, well, a lot of the time as a freelancer, your job was to just go and put out a fire somewhere. It was this project is crazy and we need help, and you start seeing the same faces and you. You start doing you know stuff barbecue or whatever and it's it's been different with the work from home setup and there's been a lot of different avenues that they've tried to do virtual town hall hangouts uh we've done like an open kitchen channel so it's kind of like oh, i'm getting coffee in the kitchen and you can just kind of talk to people i think um for me it's been a lot of as, as I put it to, we had a survey that came out maybe three months after we'd started work from home. And one of the questions was, uh, oh God, it was something about like people's mentality. How, how have you noticed people have been dealing with work from home? And I wrote that the introverts have never been happier. <laughs> they, they, you talk to them once a week. Like, you know, if, if they're on a show where they can just do their job and they don't deliver till Thursday, they're gone, right? And I said, and the extroverts are on the phone with me for three hours a day. Like I am on my phone all the time. My phone is lit up three times during this. Like I am always talking to people and that's kind of how I've tried to deal with it is just being an open channel because without being able to go into the same room and catch a beer and shoot the shit about something, you can't really gripe about the job you're on. Ah, oh, it's Friday. Let's unwind and vent. You can't do that so much. So, um, now it's it's just kind of whenever somebody needs an ear, I'm available, and they they complain about whatever they need to complain about and feel better, and everybody's all smiles. It's, <laughs> it's how how I've been dealing with it for the last year. I don't know. Hmm. Um, I guess for us, yeah, one one neat thing that we've done is um, there's a Slack channel you can join called Coffee Talk. And if you're part of that, every Monday they'll pair you with like a random person. So you'll just have one-on-one -on -one hang out in the morning while you're drinking your coffee or your tea or whatever. Um, so I know that's been like a nice social outlet for some folks. Um, you know, I guess besides that, just, you know, thinking for, for anyone who's entering the industry right now, like so many companies have really, you know, hired a bunch of people right now who haven't met each other in person yet. So you're definitely in very good company um, at like all experience levels there. Yeah, and it's it's not just juniors. Like we we've got a our oh I forget the actual title. It's head of production. She started as a producer, freelance producer on a, a project I was on. And then a year later, you know, she's she's like managing producer of everybody, and she's never seen anybody in person. She's been work from home the entire time. It was last March was when we we worked together, and you know now she's a manager and still has never seen any of us. It's it's just it's the new normal. Everybody's adapted. We're all you know dealing with it. But how often does that happen, kind of anyway? Because you have studios in remote you know, in other countries and other places. I mean, I know of artists that I would supervise that, you know, I felt like I had this camaraderie. Like I say, you're in the trenches with them uh, doing this work. And I realized I've never been in the same city as you. <laughs> um, so like you say, it's, um, you know, how how is this maybe fun? You know, now it's the person you haven't been with is not in Montreal or New York. They're just four miles away. You haven't been working with them in close proximity. Is it that different maybe? Um, I don't know. I think that it's, at, at this point, everybody's a, 
the little box on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, the only the only person I've seen in person it's been uh, a couple of our artists who there there are some people who are going into the studio um, just because the, there's well, I'm sure we'll talk about it later but a work life you know balance and for some people it was I don't want to work from home I. I like my commute. It clears my mind. It gets me in the space that I need to be. And then I can do my work and I can leave and I don't have to think about somebody talking to me after hours. I don't have to look at my phone for a random ping where somebody's like, oh, I have a question about it. It's just they leave it all at the door. Um, and so apart from, I think, maybe five coworkers, the only other person I've really seen is uh, my wife in the last year. And... Uh, I saw my folks at one point because everybody's vaccinated, so I drove up north to visit my family. Um, but it's, you know, less than a dozen people. Uh, so, you know, you're all figments of my imagination as far as I'm concerned. I've been at my spider hole for the last year. And We're just bots. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> this, this is all metahuman right here. <laughs> I feel uh, five looks great. <laughs> I, I, I skipped on the background to save Polly's. Uh, Brandon, in terms of the sort of uh, team building and kind of building the culture of the studio, uh, what about you? I mean, our team, like right now, we're working on video game trailers. So we kind of have a set time each week to play the video game together, which is a really, really good way to for team building. And mm -hmm. it's great when you work with your supervisors and your coordinators, like, all right, I'm going to gun down this 13-year-old. <laughs> 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 Don't clip that soundbite. Bonding yeah. over bullying yeah. children. Cyberbullying <laughs> children. <laughs> Whatever works. It's, it's a great way to team build, and it, it's a great way to learn about each other and learn about, like, you, you feel less afraid to ping someone, like, to ask them a question after you, like, you know, run down some valley with them to, to, to shoot up a little crew of other people. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, Michelle, how about you? Uh, yeah, when we were, when I first started as like a trainee, the first like three, four months, we actually, as a, a whole group with all the different trainees in the different departments had once a month, we did these really fun activities. So the first one was a virtual escape room where we got mm -hmm. put in these little groups and it was really cool. You could like click around and it was very, I've never been to a real escape room, but it felt mm -hmm. very as real as it possibly could be. And it was really fun. Uh, and then the next one, they sent us a little cake decorating kit. So we got all, everyone was on Zoom in their kitchens, like decorating this cake together. Uh, so doing like little uh, activities like that was really fun. Uh, and we always have these like morning coffees where people can kind of jump in to a Zoom. And we have just like random like little social hours like throughout the week. Um, and they're just like Zoom calls that anyone can jump into. Uh, and then when I was at school, something that I did with my friends that I had met in person at school and when we transitioned at home, we were using Discord a lot. And we were kind of jumping into Discord, even just with the audio or with the video, just to kind of all be working, even though we were all working on our own school projects at the same time, just to kind of be on there and like chatting and talking like while we were working was really uh, something that helped me get through a lot of uh, just the hours where I was just working on projects on my own. Uh, it was really nice to be able to like talk to them and even just like chat about stuff that wasn't, you know, school or work related. Mm -hmm. So that was really nice too. Oh, awesome. That's very cool. Um, one challenge I think everybody's kind of faced here is uh, when you're here in your living room or wherever working on uh, your workstation, um, you're in a space, maybe looking at a screen that you're used to playing games, watching movies, doing social media, random escapist bullcrap. And now you're having to look in the same screen in the same physical space and now be a disciplined work employee. Um, so I want to speak to the idea of um, strategies for staying focused and avoiding all the distraction um, you know, around you in a place where you're typically uh, relaxing. I mean, Has that me, been a challenge? Oh, sorry. No, no, <laughs> For please, me, please. a big part of it was just keeping my space like as clean as possible and making sure that uh, my because my bed is like one one foot, you know, over <laughs> here. So keeping like my desk space as clean as possible um, really, really helps to kind of like keep me focused. And then I have like my work machine and then my laptop where I just do Zoom calls. And as long as I'm keeping, you know, just my music on my laptop and then 
uh, just like work stuff on my work machine uh, has kind of like helped me. It definitely was a challenge. Like when I was first transitioning into like school from home, it was really difficult to kind of like get used to that. Uh, but I think as you kind of go on, you kind of the value in like your own little corner, of, even if it's just like a corner of your bedroom, that's only for work. And then after that, you can kind of go and do whatever, uh, you know, it was definitely really helpful for me to get used to that. I think for me, it's it's almost kind of been like, um, I don't know, like Nomen, like the, the tips and tricks that I got myself to really hunker down and focus there have just continued to apply working from home. Um, so stuff like having rituals really helps, um, you know, like starting the day with like a cup of tea and watching something or like, um, it, I feel like it's weird, like the stuff that helps the most is getting away from the computer when something's not working. Um, especially like trying, if I'm trying to solve a problem and I'm just stuck on it and it's like getting frustrating, like literally just going for a walk and kind of letting your brain rest and just let the back end brain kind of chew on it for a while. Um, stuff like that can be really helpful. Nice. Uh, and I think uh, Marco may be muted. Sorry, I muted myself. I had a okay, very yeah, loud, loud cat screaming in the background, and I wasn't <laughs> sure if you guys could hear her, so I had to let her out. Um, for me, it's it, I'm lucky enough to have a home office. That's what it boils down to. Uh, it, I've known people who have had to work in their living room during quarantine, uh, setting up like we've got it. Uh, our our layout supervisor has been doing like scans and acquisitions of you know coffee cans and stuff like that for commercials in his dining room on a table. Like it, not everybody has the leeway of having their own physical space to work in. And it, it makes things a lot easier. Um, being able to, you know, I close my door, my wife knows that I'm working on something she's not allowed to see most of the time. So it's, we're good. Um, and I think that when it comes to unwinding and like you said, your your workstation is usually where you're playing games or whatever. I, I Yesterday played Rocket League for a good two and a half hours after I was done with the day. Shout out Psionics, Jay Zang. <laughs> um, so I would say that you know it's just a matter of your own self discipline, how you how you've managed things. Uh, for me, a lot of it is listening to podcasts, music, um, kind of just getting into a headspace where I can put my horse blinders on and get to work. Um, or some of the time I'm in managerial mode where I'm on calls, talking to people, making sure that everything's running fine, that they know where things are and can find all the assets that they need for whatever projects are coming up or anything like that. So um, I think by staying busy, that helps to keep me focused. Whereas if there were any sort of idle time, I could see where I would just kind of linger and uh, maybe I'll open Reddit and start browsing. <laughs> um, but I, I think that that's, that's what it's, it's been keeping yourself busy helps keep your focus intact. Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest part of it. Yeah. Brandon. I mean, keeping yourself busy is, is so important. Like, you know, you, throughout the day, you kind of have like a mountain of tasks to do and you just check them off one by one, which is such a good feeling when you like get to put that check on it. <laughs> and lists, right. <laughs> And like my, my team really, really helped me stay focused. Uh, I was lucky enough to work with a lot of our Nomen uh, alumni and we are on a call like for most of the day. So it kind of feels like you're at Nomen sitting at the desk, like we're across from each other where you can bounce ideas off each other. Like, oh, does this shot look right to you? Like, how does this movement look? Do, do you have any better idea on how we can approach this? So keeping that open communication not only help our project, but it helps keep each other busy and keep each other focused on what's at hand. I, I think being able to step away helps a lot too. And this is, I wish I did it, but I don't, I used to, like when I was in the office, I would go for walks around the block all the time. And now that I'm working from home, I get in this mode where it's like, oh, I've been sitting here for the last 10 hours straight. I lost track of time. Oops. It, it's really important to set a timer for yourself, some sort of reminder to be like, hey, you need to not, like I have a standing desk, so I do, it's not like I'm sitting all day, but 
you're stuck at your desk all day and you just, you can't do it. It's part of the work from home thing that, that has cracked me up is a lot of talk of like, oh, don't forget to take your lunch break. And it's like, what lunch break? I'm grabbing food and putting it in front of my keyboard. Like I, I sit at my desk all day. Like I'm <laughs> busy. So depressing. It's, it's terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. Yeah. And, well, that, and, that's, that's the converse is, uh, it's one thing to stay focused, but it's another when your work is there in your home, yes. uh, being able to step away from it. Yes. And that's, that's where you should set a timer for yourself something just to remind you like go be human for 20 minutes go walk around the block uh if there was a good stretch during quarantine when we first like in the uh, three months after where you know it, for a while it was triage it was you know certain shows canceled we aren't going to be hiring all these people we thought we were going to like there was a big staff up that we we kind of shelled and there was a lot of concern of like we have to you know, we got a couple new shows. We got to make sure that they they go well. And so there was a lot of late nights for you know six plus, six plus months. I was just hopping on anything and everything, making sure everything went out and looked good, and we were you know in the right place because you know, you know, everybody was scared at that point. It was like, what's going on with the industry? Nobody was shooting commercials, so what do you do for a commercial house? Um, and so I was doing just heavy hours, and I stopped myself and set a timer and was like, I have a backyard. I'm going to enjoy it. It's sunny out. It's it's springtime. Like, I'm going to set, and I set an alarm, and I, was, I just went and laid out in suntan for a half hour. And it was like, that in the middle of the day made all the difference in the world because in my dark room with blackout windows, I don't see the sun. So I'm going to make sure to schedule that time. I'm going to take a little cat nap out in the sun, try and recharge my batteries. And it made a huge difference. And, you know, up until recently, I was good about going for walks. And I was good about making sure to just do things around the house that kept me away from my desk for 10 minutes at a time and help kind of keep your keep yourself human and not just a worker bot. Yeah. I, f I feel like it's kind of a mental shift to, like, coming out of school, like, one thing that I really loved about starting to work is that you can just leave it at work. Unlike Noman, where I was like, I gotta be working uh, working on homework seven days a week. Um, and I think that honestly will be more challenging for the folks graduating now. And uh, I guess I say it because it's something to be really mindful of is to safeguard your rest time because it is as important as your work yes. time. And if you are mm -hmm. not taking care of that, then you're just gonna burn yourself out and everybody loses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Michelle, do you find it um, more difficult? You know, if, if your bed is right there, when you're trying to go to sleep, it's like your brain's still right there on work? <laughs> no, I feel like I've gotten pretty good at like, once it gets to the end of the day, I'll, I need to like leave my bedroom after that mm -hmm. for a while before I can come back to like go to sleep because mm -hmm. I've been here all day. So I usually like, you know, we'll go to the living room or like go out um, and, you know, go get, like go physically out to like pick up takeout is kind of a big thing. Uh, just so I can like leave the house for uh, even for like 20 minutes or so. Um, and then I can come back. And then once I, you know, come back, it feels like a different thing. It feels like after work. Uh, so that was like something that helped me. Nice. Yeah. Uh, Brandon, how about you? I mean, uh, I mean, throughout quarantine, it's hard to be away from your friends and family. So they have been really helping me step away from work. Where before work, after work, I would call my family, call my friends, and just have that sense of social hour where we're really, really missing during the during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's something that's I think kind of. Uh, an idea is kind of a rare unicorn, unfortunately, in our industry is the idea of work life balance. Um, that, you know, you, you do get these 911 times where you just have to be on call and working crazy hours. Um, but uh, do you think that being remote, um, I mean, the industry is what it is and it has demands when it, it has it. But do you think that being able to be remote versus in the studio? Uh, can help promote a work-life balance, or do you think it's hindered it, or just maybe made different challenges for getting there? Um, I would say that it's 
that's a studio per studio basis. It's really about whatever the culture of the place you're at is about. And, you know, we've, I think we've in the last year have made a big point about like, I've, I, there's been a handful of projects where, you know, I'm doing monster hours cause that's what's needed. Um, but I've had the conversation with producers and with crewing about how, you know, Hey, if you need extra help and you need to, to ship, you're gonna have to find a freelancer. Like I'm putting my foot down. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm done with 14 hour days. Like we've, we've been doing this for a year. If, if you're at a point where you need more people, that's where you need to start hiring because now you're going to take advantage of it. Um, and it's not like anybody's doing it on purpose. It's just a case where you become reliable and everybody wants to be reliable, but at a certain point you are enabling somebody to allow you to be double booked on something or, you know, stuff like that. So I think that part of it is on the onus of the artist to push back. We've had a lot of people who were really good about it where it was like, no, I, it's six o'clock. I'm done. Like F off. And others who were like, you know, well, if we don't get this thing done, we may lose the client freak out. Ah! And a lot of that mentality has kind of shifted over the last year where people are, are better about identifying that staying ahead of it. Um, really a lot of that is on production to make sure that they don't overwhelm an artist with a bunch of things that, that bottled up and now you're, you know, at a point. Um, for me as a bit of a bottleneck on the asset side, um, that's where I've, I've had to ask for help and they've brought in freelancers and I've got my list of freelancers that I, I prefer and guys that I've known forever and they come in and help out with whatever comes up. Um, but that work life balance is where, you know, we've got certain people that are just like, no, I, I, like you talked about going to pick up your takeout. It was, I need a commute. I, I drive in and, you know, there's not as many cars, so it's not so bad, but that puts me in the mentality of I go to work, I go to the office, I, and I'm out at 5.30. And we've got one of those guys who's been doing that for maybe four months now, uh, where he's the only person that goes in, but he's cleared, he's, he's got, you know, he goes through all the protocols, make sure everything's safe, and he's basically one of the only three people in the building. Um, but that, that, you know, came up where it was like, no, I don't, I, I'm tired of being available, I don't want to be available. So let's just make sure that that gets nipped in the bud. Others, you know, I've told people my phone goes on silent at 6 p.m. Production knows. I may be working late, but if I am, that means I don't want to be bothered. So hmm. I'm, I'm happy to do my job, but I don't need to be answering questions about stuff that isn't you know, pertinent at that moment. Hmm. Leave me alone. Let me do it. Well, that's totally a good point. Like, I feel like, like that was true before, but even more so now, like one thing that's important to be cognizant of at work is that you really defined the boundaries with other people of like when they can contact you or, or when they can expect things from you. Um, so, you know, I totally had to learn from experience that like, if I get a work message and I read it at 10 PM, even if I don't need to respond to it, it's just, it might stress me out. So I'm just going to totally ignore it until the next day. Um, and because people know that they'll, you know, they're fine with hearing from me the next day. Yeah. I haven't learned that lesson. I, I read an email <laughs> late last night. No, it was like an email is like, Oh, let me just check. And then I realized, yeah, I'm not gonna be able to sleep because I read this email and I'm thinking about how to deal with this crisis in the morning. So yeah, it's, it, it's hard. I've uh, turned off <laughs> notifications after 6 PM. And that's, that's been my big thing is that, uh, you know, they, Everybody knows that if they really need to get a hold of me, they know how. They can. My phone number is in my email footer, right? Like if you need to text me, they can text me. And I've had nine one ones where it's like I'm in the middle of dinner and I'm getting texts. Like, what the hell is going on? Oh, something went wrong on a shoot, and we have to ask you. Quite okay, shit. Okay, let me. Sorry for the cursing. Uh, stuff comes up, right? Um, but they understand now. After and it took a couple months, where it was like, yeah, no, my phone is on silent. You won't be able to get a hold of me. If it's really important, you know how, but if it's, it better be important, because if not, you're going to hear about it the next day. I'm going to let you know. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm always I'm a very blunt person. So if it's BS and you're, you're pinging me at 8 p.m., you better have a good reason. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's like you were saying before too, it's totally a two-way street because, um, I mean, it's great when leadership and like my lead is really great about like trying to make sure nobody's getting burnt out. But at the same time, you know, they're not next to you. They can't see the stress in your shoulders. And so it's really important that you say like, hey, like, Ugh, I'm starting to feel a little overwhelmed right now because if you don't say that, like, how are they supposed to know, right? And that's one of the reasons why I was doing, I still do calls all the time with people because it's just a, hey, I want to check in, see how you're doing. I mean, God, for the first six weeks of the pandemic, I was Monday through Wednesday, I was making three calls, three different people calls a day. And it was, I, you know, checklists, talking about checklists. How's your physical health? How's your mental health? And do you have toilet paper and medicine? in case it comes up because at that point it was the you know, toilet paper shortage. Everybody was going crazy. So it was, you know, I'm, I'm just calling to check in, make sure you're okay. How everything's going, you know, not work life, but just life. You're, you're doing okay. Everybody's fine. You, you're good. Okay. Um, all right. Now let's on to the next person. Let's make sure everybody's staying safe and is doing okay. Cause it, it was, it was a weird time for everyone. Know, not hearing that certain people weren't being checked up on was worrying. Was like, Nobody's talked to so and so. Okay, I'll, I'll give them a call. Yeah, that's the thing I, I tell my students is proactive communication. That that's you know if I'm in the classroom and in the lecture I can look over at the student and see that he's got that one sad tear coming down his eye because my lecture's too hard. You know, I can, okay, fine, cool, we'll take care of this. We can explain this, we'll get you up to speed. I can't see that one sad tear going if yeah. your um, webcam is off and you aren't speaking up. Um, so, you know, all of this communication, I think a lot of it does boil down to being proactive and speaking up, you know. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, if, if they're speaking up, trying to tra get that sort of culture of it's okay to talk and having those, like you're saying, reaching out to people. Um, so uh, uh, in terms of uh, work-life balance, uh, Brandon. I mean, coming, like graduate, graduating from Nomen, it was like horse blinders on, focus on your reel, get this done. And so it was a little bit of a difficult learning process going from like working on your reel to working at a company and working on like actual production because I mean, in the beginning, I was a little bit stressed. I was like, oh my God, I get to work on all these cool projects, like throw yourself at it. But throughout the pandemic, you like slowly learn like, okay, I, this, this is a job and like you have to work normal hours, let your, like communicate with your coordinators, communicate with your soups. If I'm running into problems or, you know, not feeling so great, like they're there to help me. And understanding that was one of the biggest lessons I learned. So being able to communicate with them so I can be happy as an artist working, you know, even if we have to work, a lot, you know, overtime or a long hours to make sure that I don't burn out. So it took a couple of months to like really, really get, get the hang of things and learn it and like step away from work at times. But I mean, throughout this process, like I'm still learning today <laughs> on how to like properly handle work-life balance. No, oh, totally yeah. understand. Yeah. Uh, I kind of have the same experience. I think like the last few months of school was just so much. It was the same thing, like finish the demo reel, like get everything in, you know, work all, yeah, you know, working really long days uh, just to get it finished. And then literally a month later I started uh, working and I had very like specific hours. I wasn't working like any overtime, like it was just like a training program. Uh, and we had to have the whole conversation of once the day is over, once the Friday, you know, comes around, like you don't, you stop working, you know, you can't, even if you really want to, if you want to like get all those extra hours and it's not like school where you can kind of just work as long as you want to, uh, you work like within the hours that you're supposed to work. And that was kind of like a weird thing that I didn't really think of until it, kind of came up that like once it was over, I was like, oh, work's over. I like literally, you know, cannot really work on this until the next day. Um, and now I've kind of gotten to the point where like I'm in production, but we haven't really gotten to crunch time yet. And so I haven't really experienced that. Um, but I, from what I can tell, everyone's been really 
they've always been really open about like if if you feel like you're getting burnt out, if you need to take like a personal day or even just a few hours, like everyone seems very um, open to that and willing to, you know, work with you and make sure that you're as comfortable as possible while you're working. I think so, there's yeah. been a lot of change in the idea of what your work day is, because for the longest time, it was, you know, depending on the studios, nine to six or 10 to seven. Mm -hmm. And I think that with the work from home situation, everybody has come to realize that there are more important things in life. We've, we've all dealt with, you know, knock on wood, you haven't lost anybody to COVID or you haven't had a family member get sick of something else in the past, whatever it is, you know. Uh, I had an uncle who, he had a heart issue, he passed away and it was, he's gonna be cremated and there's no funeral. Like what, they, you, what are you gonna do? And the reality of that situation that everybody has come to, to kind of focus in on is if you have something you need to deal with, nobody's gonna give you shit about it because Something comes up and you go, oh, hey, I, you know, I flagged it two days ago, but, you know, Wednesday morning, I'm going to be out until noon for miscellaneous reason. Generic excuse. And people go, cool. Okay. Just make sure your stuff's done by end of the day, Thursday, like you said you would. Cool. No problem. It's everybody understands that there is a bigger world than whatever the project is that you're on now. And when you're in the office, there is kind of an inherent peer pressure of like, oh, Half the team's staying late and we bought dinner, so uh, you've got stuff to do. Like, there'll be food. And you're like, oh, I guess I can stay late. <laughs> none, none of that crap. Like, it, it is now a case of, like, you own your time. If Especially with, you know, senior artists. It's they own their task line, whatever their task list is. And they know whatever date everything's got to be turned in. Everybody's, like, working professionals. You trust them, you know them, you know they're going to get their stuff done, and you just let them be. And, it, you know, on, in my case, I'm doing an NDA thing that I'll never be able to show or talk about, and it's a case where I've been left alone for three weeks. I've, I've talked to my producer. He G-chatted me yesterday to ask how things were going. Did the lighter get the things that he needed? Did the end get, well, yeah, everything's done. Okay, cool. Thanks. That's it. Um, nobody, it, the, the people who are panicking right now about people working from home are the micromanagers. It's the people who are like, my job was to go around to make sure everybody's busy. Now I can't do that because I can't. Um, that, that went out the window a year ago. It's, it's now a case of you can see what artists do. They're here for a reason. We're all responsible. We're all dedicated. We are doing this not for the money. We, we love what we do. That's why we're doing it. It's the whole point. You know, I'm not going back to waiting tables ever again. I'm done with that. So, you know, I'm, I, I think seeing how people have adapted and knowing that it's about their own dedication and, and managing their time, if, if they know how to do it, then it's, it's plug and play. I've had plenty of freelancers who have done everything we've asked them to and I guarantee you, they're not doing any extra hours that they don't have to. You know, they're not getting, you know, if they give you a, a day rate, they're, they're doing that day. So uh, it's, it's been nice to see. It's been good to see people kind of taking more ownership of, of their, their time and their lifestyle around the project, as opposed to having a project dictate their life. Because I've been on plenty of, I've been doing this for 10 years. I've been on plenty of projects that dictated my life. I, when my wife and I got married, I left, I was working at Disney and games. I left Friday at noon. We went to Vegas, got married and I was back to work on Monday morning. Cause I was doing 70, I did 75 hours that week and I left it Friday at noon. There's been plenty of jobs where I've done insane hours. And now that's, that's uh, not that it never happens, but you're able to better dictate that information of that, that kind of workflow. There's more ownership on artists' plates. And it's good. It's good. Because we know what we're doing. We've been doing it. We're the ones doing the work. So it makes it kind of easier. No, I think, and definitely a, a shout out to all the uh, uh, partners and spouses of um, people in this industry who have to uh, bear with the long hours, <laughs> all that. 
Um, now, uh, something else that uh, we kind of touched on, um, beyond what uh, we as artists are doing, kind of the people in our little world, thinking higher up, we're working with highly sensitive uh, IPs. And the idea of we have these NDAs, I'm sure that probably, you know, you know, you probably can't talk about most of the work you're doing right now. Um, and, you know, I know like, you know, Michelle, you're with Disney, which is like the, the epitome of IP security, that if you're on Disney, Marvel, Star Wars stuff, you have to go through special rigorous training of how not to leak things and all this stuff. So that was, I'm sure, a big issue when we all began working at home. I know when you work on a, a Marvel um, property, you are not supposed to have uh, internet access on your workstations. So you can't just like upload Instagram. Here's my shot of Thanos. I'm going to upload this and cool. Um, so uh, what's your perception of uh, NDAs and security now that you're not in a, you know, the, the closed vault of your studios, but you're at home? I mean, I think the main thing that I've noticed is that there's such a huge level of trust between um, mm -hmm. the company and the artist. Because I actually, there hasn't been a lot of like, you know, very stern, you know, talks about it. It's kind of just an accepted thing um, in like the, the culture that you keep it quiet. And, um, you know, I still have internet access on my machine, but uh, yeah, just for me, it definitely just comes down to, to trust and everything. And the, we're very specific about certain things that have been released and have not been released. So they always say like, keep this under the hat, like don't say anything about it. Um, but, you know, they're, I haven't really had any like very strict like locked doors you know we're gonna come after you if you know uh it's definitely been very just an accepted thing that right when i started that that's just kind of how things were but, yeah. cool. anybody else because i'm sure you can't be talking about a lot of the projects you're doing <laughs> yeah i mean at insomniac it was kind of similar like they they feel like they were really honest with themselves and us about the reality of the situation like i remember someone asking like what a well what about our family members seeing our screen and they were like it's gonna happen but i mean hopefully you trust your family and we trust you so you know before i guess the biggest one was before the ps5 came out um we all had dev kits so they just that that was probably the biggest thing you know they asked like hey don't let your teenage kid like take a picture of it and put it on instagram but um yeah i mean there's just been a lot of trust there which has been nice and I would imagine if we really had any big leaks, you would know about them because you would, I mean, I, I've not heard of any giant leaks. Somebody did leak the PS5 dev kit, but uh, wow. I think it was like, I don't know, some random testing person in Brazil or something. So okay. <laughs> um, for me, it's been a lot of the, N the NDAs I've signed have been the, we don't come after the company. We come after you directly type, you know, I've joked for years that my mortgage and everything is in my wife's name only so that if <laughs> something were to ever happen, they could never take my house. Um, it, it's, oh, it's, it's dark. It's a dark <laughs> joke, but it's, no, I, I, I'm laughing. I, there's, there's been, I mean, yeah, it, over the years I have signed some very daunting paperwork, uh, stuff that has been very specific about how, you know, if you screw this up, you will be ruined and you'll never work again. Have a good day. And you're just like, <laughs> oh my God, this is, do I need a lawyer to read this? Uh, so, and I've, I mean, I've had NDAs on NDAs. So like, I literally couldn't get a copy of an NDA, which is illegal as far as I know. So it, I mean, when it comes to work from home, I have done some projects that are, beyond, they're not just like NDA black, they're Vanta Black, just super top secret. And that's why I have blackout curtains, locks on my doors. It's just the wall safe if they ever needed to send me something. But I, the only time I've gone in the office over the last year other than training is been to look at something in person and, you know, hold it, look at it, take a magnifying glass and inspect every nook and cranny because I have to build a 3D version of it. Um, so knowing that one of the projects that, you know, when we first started working from home was a super top secret black project, it kind of set that bar where it was like, 
you've been doing this long enough. We trust you guys. And if something goes wrong, you know, we'll own a piece of property in South Central. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cool. uh, no, Brandon, no, no, anything no. with you? I mean, I think only entertainment like uh, Michelle and Jen said, it's a lot of trust. And we do have to you know, go through a few layers of VPNs to like sign into our machines and sign into the programs and the project we're working on. But beyond that, it's just a lot of understanding like, okay, like we're working on this project, like don't you know you know not to show it to anyone else. And even if like we're living with somebody, like not just you have to sign the NDA, like your family member and whoever you're living with also have to sign it. That NDA. Cool. That's cool. Um, yeah, my family doesn't care. They can care less about it. So <laughs> it's like my daughter doesn't care. <laughs> That's the best part about the NDAs is that the stricter they are, the more nobody cares about what. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I remember working at a studio where they had um, a, a screening room for a place that the giant window. It was a huge bay window that was visible off the 90 freeway. And so you could literally like drive past the 90 if the curtains were open, you could like, oh, look, they're screening that. That's cool. And, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's, um, uh, it, it's nice they're trusting artists because that's something that I think was maybe a, a little bit lacking, but we've kind of proven ourselves. And I, I think that's something to um, the idea we, we've proven our artists have proven themselves that they are trustworthy and that we can work from home. This is the industry has still survived um, this past year. So uh, ask you to kind of prognosticate here. Uh, what do you think uh, sort of some of the lasting impact of this is going to be? You know, once everything, everybody's vaccinated and we've got herd immunity, we're kind of back. Um, is this, is remote working more of a new normal um, or are other uh long lasting effects going to be carried on from what we learned this past year? Uh, it's the new normal. It, it, I, I know that there's going to be a lot of, a lot of companies who own their buildings are like, Hey, we want you to come back to our office. Cause we paid a lot of money for it. But <laughs> it's true. Um, but I think that like we've been talking about, the artists have proven that they can do the work. We can still hit all the notes. We do everything that needs to get done. And nobody has leaked any information. There's no screenshots floating around. There's nothing that would have gotten you in trouble in the office space. And I think that, you know, in the, on the subject of junior artists, you still need FaceTime with them. And you still, next week, I'm hoping to do a session for a week with our juniors. Um, you still need that time to do demos and train them in person. Um, you can't lose that. A little bit of hands-on experience goes a long way. But there is a sweet spot for working from home, and it's the senior artists, because they can work from anywhere, you can give them any task, and they can knock it out, and they'll be good. It's just plug and play. We, it, there's, there's going to be companies that hold off on keeping people long-term work from home, and they will lose talent because there's going to be other companies that are going to embrace it. And... We've already seen some. I, I think Psyop has completely worked from home, as far as like in the commercial world. They have an they have a studio. You can go in if you want, but you know you could work from home if you need to, if you want to. Um, so I, I can see where you know five years from now you're going to be seeing a lot of mid and senior artists who move back home wherever they came from because it's cheaper than staying in LA. Mm -hmm. uh, I know the logistics of it are always going to be a problem. There's tax breaks that come with each city. Uh, in LA, we don't do episodic work unless it's absolutely necessary because New York gets a credit for it. So yep, the, all the Netflix stuff Framestore does doesn't come to LA. We do commercials here. We do commercials, integrated advertising. Um, and so if I were to move to, like my wife's from Vancouver, if I were to move to Vancouver, how does that work? Do I go under a tax credit for Vancouver? It's There's all these little things that they're going to have to figure out, you know, what, I assume a lot of it's going to be what home office you report to for certain things, but um, all of those things are starting and that's, the, that's going to be the future. You're, you know, 10 years from now, you're going to have people working anywhere and everywhere. 
And it's not going to matter where you are. They will still prefer you to be in your home base so that you can come in and do things when you need to. But I don't foresee any, any reason why this wouldn't be embraced going forward. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it's really opened up the possibilities of, um, you know, now that they've seen and they that they can trust everyone working from home, uh, it seems like everyone's going to have a lot more flexibility to define like how they want to work. Like, do I want to go into the office? Do I want to be working here? Maybe like a hybrid situation. I know that's something we're exploring right now, um, which is really exciting in a way. I guess part of what I'm really interested to see is how those two, like being on site versus off site, um, how communication is going to work when not everyone is in the same boat together. But I mean, this has been a lot more painless than I expected. So, you know, that might be a super smooth transition too. Yeah, I mean, I think we've had kind of the same conversations about it, that, you know, maybe two or three days a week you go into the office and then the other days you work from home or even like half days where you go in in the mornings if you're a morning person and then you go home for the rest of the day. Um, obviously, like there hasn't been anything set in stone. I'm not really sure, but personally, I think that would be really nice just to go in a couple of days a week. Cause I do like the idea of like going into an office and seeing people and interacting cause you can get so like, you know, stuck at home being a homebody. Uh, so I think it'd be really nice to be able to go in, but it also every once in a while, you know, things come up, it'd be really nice to just be able to work from home um, and like have that option. We definitely have proven that we can do it and do it well. Uh, so I think it'd be really nice to kind of, you know, not just throw that away once we're all able to go back to work. Yeah, I mean, happy on Michelle's idea, like a lot of cities are doing that, like part time, like work, you know, work in the office three days a week, two days a week kind of thing where you are able to communicate with your team and, you know, actually be there for the meetings. But it's really nice to be at home where you can like cook your own meals and like be with your family or your pets. It's definitely a huge plus from being able to work at home. So having that like marriage of like that middle ground, I think will be a great asset to this industry. Mm -hmm. uh, is this wishful thinking or do you think the, uh, the studios are gonna go for this <laughs> at this point? Or is the discussion at least there as far as you can tell? It's know, there. Oh, please. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. I know at least for my studio, it's, it's conversation we're starting to have where we talk to artists and we talk to the team about like what do you prefer and for a lot of it it is a lot easier to do remote because we're communicating with the offices on the east coast in london where you are basically doing zoom meetings like this every day um so it's a conversation that just started we just started having and ideally like it would be nice you know from, from a few months from now that we will be go to the office three days a week and be able to work at home and you know have the best of both worlds mm -hmm. yeah I think um, just got a, a note in the chat here about uh, child care especially in LA being so expensive that um, this is something I think could be given to employees if you're in LA especially the cost of child care the um, extensive commutes, that this is something to kind of help bring the, the work-life balance as well as sort of a financial relief to uh, a lot of the employees. Um, uh, how about this? Uh, uh, Michelle and Brandon, you two both um, went through, uh, like I said, in-person learning to virtual learning and um, uh, having gone through virtual learning and, and done obviously well at it because you're both uh, thriving professionals, what advice would you have for someone uh, who's a student now uh, trying to maximize their learning experience in an online paradigm? I think the biggest thing that helped me like transition into school from home, and it, it, I did have like a slight advantage because I did meet people in person while I was there and I had friends. But even if you're starting uh, in online school, reaching out to other students and like trying to make friends, even though it's a little bit harder online, and you know, building a relationship with your like other classmates is so important. And being able to talk to mm -hmm. them, like even more than communicating. I mean, it's important to communicate with your professors as well. But having, you know, people that are in the same classes as you, like learning the same, they're in the same boat. It's really important just to be able to, you know, meet people and 
you know, share and uh, discuss your work and, you know, have people to be there with you as you're going through it is like has been, was the most helpful thing for me, for sure. Yeah, I mean, having that sense of community is so important. Like, I was lucky enough to, you know, be able to be at Noman and meet friends as well. But even when I went to work, like, I was in a room of strangers I never met, like, just seeing little boxes on Zoom. But, you know, being able to, like, just message someone and see if you can click. And, I mean, now I have lunch every so often with one of our tech people that, I never really met in real life, but we really hit it off. So we just have lunch together. So having, even though you never really met somebody in person, like it's, don't be afraid to like reach out and befriend somebody from the internet. Well, I mean, <laughs> you, you hear that kiddies? Random internet people are your friends. And that's what you need to do. Catfishing is not a thing, no. Uh, <laughs> No, but you know, I know absolutely. I, I hear what you're saying, and I, I, I concur. <laughs> it, it's, um, it's it's a very good point because like it would, when I was in school, one of one of my classmates, he was very active on the polycount forums, and when he graduated, it was like, oh yeah, this kid who's been posting here for the last four years went to school for it, and now he has a demo reel, and he got a job right off the bat because. Mm -hmm. He was a known person on those forums, having just asked questions for years. And then once he started school for it, it was, you know, you see somebody's character. It was, you know, he wanted it. He went out and got it. And you could see that progression. And I think that uh, just making yourself known is probably the most important thing that I harp on that for my juniors all the time. Of like, It's important for you. I, th I think one of them I yelled at at one point because it was happy hour and he only talked to the other interns and I was like get out of here get stand up and walk mm -hmm. away from this table go talk to those people over there and he was like I don't know them I was like <laughs> too bad that's the point yes people need to know you exist otherwise what are you gonna you know you're never gonna progress so mm -hmm. yeah be active yeah yeah so carrying this from um uh online learning to online working you know any advice on um you know, Jenna, Marco, any question, any advice on how to uh, ensure success through a online working paradigm? I mean, just, you know, communicate, honestly, like, uh, I know it's intimidating, especially when you, the person isn't sitting there in front of you, but like people are people, you know, everybody's goofy. Everybody's like a little bit of a kid because they're working in an industry mm -hmm. where they get to be creative all day. Like, um, you know, especially in games, I find everyone plays them. So you can always just fall back on that as a default topic. And um, yeah, I don't know. Don't don't stress about it. It's going to be fine. <laughs> nice. Yeah, there's, there's a level of um, a lot of people tend to think too serious about what we do. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like we're making, it, in your case, games, in my case, images that it's it's just it's it's all entertainment it's supposed to be fun mm -hmm. don't take it too seriously don't be high strong about it it's just it's fine it, and no matter what the project always finishes it always wraps there's no such thing as you know you get to the tail end and they cancel it oh it's over <laughs> that everything comes out and i think i've worked on two things that never showed up and one of them was an mmo when i worked at disney games and it was never going to come out as far as anybody that was working on it had a, an understanding I was like this thing's not, not going to nobody there's no market here so it's just one of those cases where don't take it too seriously understand that it's you're here for a reason you're doing it for because you love what you do you, i i got into this because i liked sculpting and you know i don't call myself a character artist but i've done like 30 plus characters over the last 10 years and it just it happens mm -hmm. uh you you end up doing a bit of everything over time and it's fun as long as you're open to trying new stuff and learning new things you'll have a great time with it the people who don't want to learn new stuff and do new things are the ones that don't stick around very long if you're mm -hmm. if you understand that it's all supposed to be fun and and, and you know 
better than a lot of other options in this world as far as a career goes, you'll be fine. It's, it's, <laughs> I've worked on some, some goofy stuff, some stuff that's dumb, some stuff that's way too serious. And it's, it's all the same. It's, it's been a good ride. Uh, it's what I tell the students is it's not, I think the, uh, the enjoyment from the career is not in the, the prestige of the shows you're working on. Or this was like a big famous, you know, a, a popular game, a popular film, but you do it because you love the act of creation. You, you love that you get to have this creative outlet to really, you're, you're making the impossible. And that, that is where I think the satisfaction lies more than this was popular. Um, yeah, it's that's a really good point. It, it's it's about enjoying what you're doing and the people you're doing it with. That's mm-hmm. the bottom line. As long as yeah. you're happy with the people you work with every day, and and it's paying your bills. What else can you ask for? <laughs> this, is, this world's in a weird place. That's that's mm-hmm. a pretty good lot to live, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, let me ask uh, one other thing here. The last year has been really weird. I mean, to put it mildly, global pandemic is weird. Uh, all the death is weird. That's putting it horrible. But um, in this kind of working paradigm, we've had to all be kind of isolated. Um, I, I think we can maybe kind of look at it as the idea of, you know, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Or kind of making lemons from lemonade. Or lemonade from lemons. Yeah, one of those. Um so how about this? Is there, um, uh, how about this? Is there anything you think that as professionals, uh, having been through this, that gives you an advantage that give you some kind of skill, some kind of perception that you wouldn't have had otherwise? I mean, definitely communicating better in text or just also like having to do it all the time, not being as nervous about it or the exact word choices or um, I don't know, just I, I, and that's I mean, I feel like that's a skill that's always going to be useful because we live in a digital world. So you're always going to be talking to people over who is not in the same room as you over text or something. Um, it's definitely strengthened my communication skills in those ways. Yeah, that was definitely something I kind of struggled with when I was at school and I just kept hearing like, this is an industry where you have to talk to people, you have to network so much, you know, and I was never really good at that. Like I don't, I was really bad at putting myself out there and talking to strangers. Uh, And I think this whole process of, especially like when I started working with all these people I'd never met before and having to reach out and ask questions, I've gotten so much better at that. Just reaching out to people and not being like nervous or afraid for whatever reason. and I think that once I go back to working in person, I think those skills are going to carry over and I'll be able to reach out to people in person the same way that I've been getting better at doing, uh, doing that online. Yeah. Nice. Brandon, have you gained superpowers from this past year? <laughs> I mean, definitely just been a lot more organized than I usually am. Like <laughs> you're, you know, dealing with tons of chats throughout the day where, you are, you know, talking to like, you know, three, four different people about different topics. So being able to like organize my tasks, organize like my chats and everything else, like definitely really helped me like get down to like, how do I be most, the most productive person I can throughout my day? Yeah, if anything, I feel like it's made me a lot more, um, it's it better at working smarter and not harder because uh, when I'm at home, you know, like my my games are here, the TV's here, <laughs> everything's here to distract me. And so I'm a lot more efficient almost at like getting stuff done so I can, you know, unplug for the day. Um, yeah, my, my communication skills are this. They're the same. I, I never <laughs> shut up. I would, I would, I was not somebody who would text somebody. I'd get up and walk over to their desk and be like, Hey, I got a question for you. It's just, that was, I, I needed the excuse to get away from my desk. So I always took it. Um, I think that for me, it's been, uh, managing, (laughs) managing expectations as that's always been the big lesson that I've always told the juniors is like, Mm -hmm. don't don't just sign up for everything. Don't just take the world on because Mm -hmm. that's the worst thing you can do is just have a producer be like, this should take like five days, right? No, it takes 10. What the hell are you doing? Like 
manage Always expectations. Always estimate double. <laughs> yes. yes. And a lot of a lot of people will be like, oh, Amador said it would take five days, so really it'll be three. And it's like, no, I said five for a reason. It's five. Leave it. Let them it'll take them five days. And so I I've always been I'm very blunt. I'm very talkative. I can't stop it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I am caffeinated all day, every day, and then I fall asleep at three and I wake up at nine. It's it's how it goes. Um so for me it was understanding how the goalposts had shifted. That the world went from major ramp ups, we're gonna be doing big projects, these are all the things on our slate for the next year. This is the idea that we're going with, we're gonna hire all these people, we're gonna do this whole thing. I mean, I literally wrote a two year plan out of how we were gonna progress on the asset department. And then it all got thrown away three months later. Because mm-hmm. what are you gonna do? You you batten down the hatches, you try and turn a profit as much as you can. Uh, at a certain point, because they weren't doing film for nine months at least, they there was you know major cost cutting that went across the company. Uh, there were you know portions of wages that got docked. Oh, we'll pay back or that kind of deal. And then people got laid off or furloughed, and that was the reality of it. Was that you know all the big film studios had people that they didn't need all of a sudden. Um, and you still had to do the projects that came in the door. And it was about managing those expectations. It was, yeah, I know you signed up for this and you thought it was going to take this long and it was going to be crewed by this amount of people, but guess what? Everything's changed. And now it's time for everyone from top to bottom to understand that we live in a different place now. And I think that that was where I got in trouble sometimes and other times it, it paid off and I, yeah, what, are, what are you going to do? But that's, that's the biggest lesson I learned was I've always done it, but during this time about managing those expectations and making sure everybody understood what was actually important. What are we actually trying to do here was, was really the biggest lesson for me to learn over that, that period. Cool. Awesome. I want to thank you all uh, for your, your time and your insight, uh, your wisdom. Um, we've, we've had some questions in the chat um, about breaking into the industry. I think some of these, um, honestly, uh, maybe better suited for uh, Noman's uh, recruitment department. <laughs> I think the people in admissions uh, would be uh, well suited for handling some of those kinds of questions more so than, uh, than here. But um, I want to thank you all so much, uh, Jenna and Marco. I think it's it's awesome to see uh, Noman alums kind of getting a view inside uh, w- the trajectory of students and where they can go. Uh, Brandon and Michelle, having had you all in class, um, I would tell you I'm proud of you, but that's super patronizing. Uh, <laughs> and I don't want to do that. Like, oh, you're so proud of me. But it, it's so exciting to see uh, what you guys have done. That's It's a real thrill. Uh, I mean, all of us at Noma, that's why we do what we do, is it's so rewarding to uh, throw ideas out um, to artists uh, and to kind of give them a voice and see where they run with it. It's it's so, it, it's uh, such a, uh, a exciting uh, school to, uh, to to work with. And um, uh, Don McCoy is here. Hey, Don. Uh, awesome. So thank you all. Uh, thanks to all in the chat, uh, everybody watching here. Um, we'll have this up on our stream channel soon. Um, so, um, and uh, as always, thanks to Miranda for helping wrangle all this and keeping us all in line. Um, appreciate it. So have a great night. Thanks.